the bigger concern as we've been speaking about is the the spread not just in india but around the world of uh, b1716 that's the covid variant which was first detected in india it's now uh, very transmissible in the united kingdom and will likely become the dominant strain of the virus in the united kingdom for the impact of this in the united kingdom and what exactly we know so far of this particular strain i spoke earlier on to dr devi sri the professor and chair of the global public health uh, department at the edinburgh university of medicine b1617 uh, as uh, the world health organization calls it uh, the variant of covid which was first discovered in india is now uh, seen in more than 40 countries around the world it is a variant of concern uh, and the spread of this variant and its transmissibility is a cause of huge concern not least of all uh, in the united kingdom where there are now studies and epidemiological tests uh, going on to try and get an idea of just what the potential impact of this may be Uh, joining us now to talk about this and a couple of other key issues is Professor Devi Sridhar. Thanks very much, uh, Devi, for being with us um, today. Firstly, um, what is the evidence at the moment to suggest greater transmissibility of B one six one seven in the United Kingdom? Well, they sequence ten um, percent of positive cases, and of those, they chart them. And what we have seen is B one one seven, or the British variant that I know India also has now, um, is quite transmissible and the dominant strain. But we're starting to see it become less of a percentage of positive cases, and B one six one seven increase. So the lines, and this is not just in Britain; it's across countries, is that it's just upwards. It's becoming more and more dominant, which means it's out competing. the other strains that we have here and is there a sense therefore that it could be more dangerous as well we know it, it it's very highly transmissible from all the evidence in india but uh, uh, is it more dangerous i don't think we know that yet because we haven't had enough cases luckily our cases per 100,000 are extremely low and we have a lot of people vaccinated over over 50s have all been offered their vaccines but we have a worry that even Even with the older type, the wild type, we know people in their 30s and 40s still need oxygen, they need fluids, they need support. So we would still have to have restrictions in place to slow the spread and try to stop it. So there's a concern, even if it's not more severe, about how do we manage, even if it's equally as severe. And therefore, uh, with the United Kingdom now uh, planning to uh, get rid of the curbs which have been in place now for a long period of time, uh, wh- where is the analysis now heading? I mean, sh- can it be done um, in an, in the next couple of days? As- originally planned well they're having a meeting later today of scientific advisors to look at the modeling so what has happened is they estimate what they think the projections are based on the transmissibility and actually given releasing all these restrictions so now let's say indoor bars are open pubs gyms gatherings are going ahead you can now go into each other's homes a lot of those restrictions are being lifted just at the time that we're seeing this variant so it's quite a precarious position We still have a lot of people under 50 not vaccinated. I think there's less of a concern about the over 50s. It's about the under 50s now. And um, what do we know about the efficacy of the existing vaccines on this strain? Especially the mRNA ones, Pfizer and Moderna. They are saying that actually we should we have not seen any variant emerge that has evaded, evaded our vaccines. Our vaccines have been offered protections. So that's quite optimistic. I hope that's the case. We're also seeing signals, and I know this is true in India as well. Of people who have been vaccinated with one or two doses coming into hospital so you have to understand how much of that is um what percentage of it what vaccine is it is this a fluke and i think we don't yet know yet they're still trying to assess that uh, how soon before this does become the dominant strain in the united kingdom at this rate um well it's hard to say but i can tell you that b117 you know went from being you know 5% of cases within weeks to over 90% of cases And so we just saw how fast, and that's happened across Europe and across the United States. And we are also seeing in India, several states have B117 as a dominant strain. And so I think we are looking at right now. It could be, you know, a matter of, of weeks before this becomes a dominant one if it is going to have the chance to keep spreading. Now, there's a great deal of hindsight, uh, obviously, available for this. In if you look at the example of the United Kingdom itself, when your hospitals in the UK were completely flooded with patients, oxygen was a problem. Uh, doctors had to make difficult choices. the uk went into a lockdown which stretched for more than 3 months and you vaccinated 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 and and that is the only way you fought off b117 right now this has emerged this the, the it's similar in many ways uh, therefore uh, what again 
is the thinking not to continue with the lockdown as it were? Well, I think we're is in a there any position. other ways, my question? Yeah, well, I think the other only way is surge testing. So what right. they are now doing is having mass testing being brought in and trying to identify anyone who has the virus and having them isolate at home. I think the only way through this, if you don't want restrictions, is isolating people quickly who have the virus or have been exposed. Um, I don't know if people, people are willing to do restrictions again. I think there's a lot of fatigue, a lot of idea of we're finally through this. We were told vaccines were the end game. So I think right now it's a careful balance of vaccinating fast enough that we can release restrictions slowly. And it's, the balance has changed now with the new variant. Are, are you happy with what you're seeing so far um, from large pharma companies on bringing out specific variants which are strain specific or which can actually handle the mutations we are now seeing? We've seen quite a few variants of concern. Uh, some of that, that doesn't seem to be very much in conversation. Well, they have shrines. I know Pfizer and Moderna can create boosters really quickly, but it's a bit of a cat and mouse game, right? Are we going to chase every single variant there is? Then you have have to vaccinate everyone against it, which we know is the difficulty mm -hmm. um, as well. We, getting the vaccine was half the battle. The other half was getting enough doses and getting them out to people, as we've seen, you know, in India, where, you know, you have the technology, it's just making enough doses, supply, and then getting them out to people into their arms. So I think that's the worry that we can develop the boosters. It's can we get them out fast enough to people if we have to keep redeveloping them. But there was a really promising study in Nature, which shows a pan-coronavirus vaccine. So one that could cover not just SARS-CoV-2 and all of its strains, but also MERS and the original SARS broad scale protection and it seemed very promising so i think that's where we might be heading actually to more universal broad scale protection because we also know there might be other coronaviruses emerging in the next couple of years so we have yeah. to plan for those also um you know lancet has in in just uh, the last uh, 24 hours or so come out with a couple of reports on on sputnik uh, one of the reports said that the data which had been presented earlier on uh, was um, was not good enough and that there needed to be more clarification and then they've published another one where uh, you know a lot of Russian scientists associated with the vaccine have said no 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 this is why we believe it's right um, what are your observations on this so far well I think to get to the heart is you need trust and trust over the data and how you get trust over the data in science is peer review and transparency so you show your results to other scientists and they scrutinize them they look for mistakes they look for any errors and based on that scrutiny does it pass a bar of approval and that's how you've had approval in the states for let's say pfizer with the fda that's how the who has had its approval processes and i think there's concerns with this vaccine that there hasn't been enough transparency on what the findings are is a very tricky balance. Usually with medicines, you don't have this kind of emergency need. So a few more weeks, a few more months, you can take your time. But I think now we're seeing emergency approvals because we know if we can't get the vaccines out fast enough, people will die. It's race against time. Yep. And that creates real pressure for scientists to get the data out quickly and to get approval quickly because yep. the choice is do you want COVID or the vaccine? And I think that's what we're seeing here. It's not clear cut, but it is undermining confidence in the Sputnik vaccine. Yeah. Uh, and, but that said, peer reviews, particularly from world-class journals, are, are the basis of science and certainly of medicine. So how is it so important to balance um, you know, peer reviews with the need to get the vaccines, including in India where Sputnik is supposed to be rolled out very soon? How do you balance the two together? Because on the ground, in all the countries where it's been introduced, it does appear to work. So who makes that choice? You know, I mean, it's, it's a tough one, isn't it? It's a really tough one. It's government regulatory agencies. We're seeing this debate right now with the AstraZeneca vaccine as well and what age groups it should be given to given the risk of blood clots. So obviously, if your choice is getting no vaccine, um, but you can live in a COVID-free world. Right. Just one final question. Um, if you talk about children, and I know that Pfizer has been cleared for children in a certain age group. In fact, uh, you know, that, that's so important. Over here in India, we're going to be starting trials with uh, Covaxin or Bharat Biotech. Um, is that a real worry that the progress which a large part of the world would have hoped uh, for children is not there? Pfizer is unaffordable for large parts of the world. And therefore, this huge group of, of citizens of our planet are going to be unvaccinated for a very long period of time. And, and you know, there was a lot of hope on AZ, AstraZeneca, but the, the, from what I'm, I hear, it's going to take some more time. Yes, exactly. I think this is the next horizon, which is getting this vaccine out to younger age groups. So Pfizer has been approved in the United States. I know New York City is rolling it out to age 12 to 15. Now they're starting trials, even of Moderna and stuff, down to six months. 
But of course, they're too expensive for large parts of the world. But hopefully it can pave the way. We need to have these trials ongoing. We need to be thinking of vaccinating children because we don't know what the next variant might emerge. We don't know what's on next on the horizon. So you want to be prepared with a vaccine to offer children protection as well, which is what we do against a range of diseases. Usually we vaccinate kids when they're quite young. And just one final question to you. I know that I said the last one was the final one, but I <laughs> promise you this one is, what are your thoughts on generic um, branding of, uh, of, of anti-COVID medication and of vaccines? This is a process now at the WHO, which has started India and South Africa championing this, the United States having backed that process. It is going to take time. Um, that said, do you believe that this is the right way to go in the context of a global emergency? Yes, definitely. I think we have seen this before in global emergencies. Think of HIV. And I think actually at a certain point, the question is how much profit is enough for pharma? When do they say we've made enough money? And I think the bar here is not saying pharma doesn't need to make money. Of course they need to make money. But when does that, where's that bar? Where you say, actually now you've made enough, you've recouped it, you've made much more for your stakeholders. Now you need to think about people losing their lives. But it's not just IP that's the issue now, I think. It's about manufacturing capacity, tech transfer. So actually there's the know-how to do it, you know, making the facilities, having the human resources. So I think there's a couple things. Just releasing the IP rights isn't enough. It's actually quite a few things, but it's definitely an important step. And I'm happy to see the U.S. also support India and South Africa in that. Professor Devi Sridhar, wonderful speaking to you as always. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you.